Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We have an extraordinary panel, so I'm going to be very, very short in my introduction notes. We're just talking about the new lead character, so we exactly will define what that means. But pioneers in global film and television industry have set out to tell us their stories. They celebrate human complexity and human diversity. So what happens in a society when actually global popular culture includes a more diverse group of leading characters. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, a pretty impressive panel from all walks of life, from all walks of the world. This is what you get at, at the World Economic Forum. We have four panelists, four countries, four regions. Haifa Al-Mansour, independent filmmaker, Saudi Arabia. Waja, thank you so much. Mr. Karan Johar, head of Damar Productions India. Thank you very much. Jingxing, choreographer and owner of the Jingxing Dance Theater in Shanghai, People's Republic of China, and Forrest Whitaker, a social activist and sustainable development goals advocate, Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative from the USA. Thank you all for joining us. Now, as we pause and reflect a little bit about lead characters, my first question would be, what exactly is the role of entertainment and film? Is it to entertain or is it actually to educate? Halifa. Well, it's hard to separate the two. It's hard. You don't want to make a film that is boring and only like educating people. That is what they pay for to go to the cinemas, right? They want to go and have fun. It's and have dinner and talk to their friends. But also, you don't want to make those empty films that people don't get something out of it. And especially from places, I will speak about where I come from, from Saudi Arabia. Like it's a place that you want to open and you want people to be more tolerant. You want them to act to see the hidden lives of women and their aspiration and that they want to move forward with their lives and have, like, lead something different. And for me, when I make a film, I don't want to separate entertainment from having to say something that is meaning, meaningful to me as a person. And, but also moving away from big slogans. It's not like, we are not, um, we are activists, but we are artists as well. So it's always that balance where you have to bring a human character that is, that people can relate to and understand and feel their pain and feel their happiness. And that is how, for me, how to bring the two. And, and where I come from, I think film and entertainment should push the values of tolerance and, and move, move the society forward, for sure. Karan? Uh, well, I would die, I'm dying to give you a socially responsible answer to that question. <laughs> um, and I would love to kind of say that, you know, my cinema has moved mountains, uh, but it hasn't. Um, I come from a country which uh, is largely, um, has been an entity, cinema has been a tool of tremendous entertainment. There's been lots of song, there's been lots of dance, there's romance, there's drama. In fact, there's melodrama. Um, we don't believe in drama, we believe in excess. Um, it's, only, it's only in the recent past where there's a certain social accountability that has crept into the fabric of Indian cinema. Uh, it's the last decade where I feel films, and for those Indians in the room who know their films that released last year, a film called Dangal, which talks about women empowerment, a film called Pink, which again addresses the issue of Eve teasing, which is a predominant issue in India. Um, and some of us are now, and I made a film called Kapoor and Sons, which touched upon homosexuality for the first time in mainstream Indian cinema. Um, I feel accountable today, but I haven't done anything that has been socially relevant in that scheme of things. Um, mm -hmm. I've made mainstream films, I run a studio. For me, commerce has always superseded art. Uh, but today, when I sit in my chair, and I see the importance of what's happening in cinema worldwide, I feel very accountable. So it's a recent phenomenon. It's a recent movement. And um, sitting in Davos and the World Economic Forum, I'd love to so sound more profound about the work I've done. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, I can't. I think, I think you're, you're just being modest, yeah. falsely modest. No, I mean, I'm just saying, needle, I'm saying you're it as it is boundaries. because I would love to give you a response. And if you go through Wikipedia and look me up and you see the movies, you will probably laugh if I tried to sound too clever about the work I've done. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to say that, you know, the big modus of my cinema has been to entertain, but there has been a dramatic shift in the last 10 years, and that's because there is a certain accountability. Call it the, the phenomenon of social media, or uh, call it the fact that the media has become such a prevalent force that you feel like right now you need to do something strong in the world of entertainment to make a mark. And I see that happening not just in India. I see it happening in Hollywood, in China, and, and or in, in Saudi Arabia, and everywhere in the world that makes movies. I feel suddenly filmmakers feel responsible. Uh, I don't know how much of that is genuine, uh, I'm trying to pretend to be. Uh, 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 half of me feels it, half of me still getting there. <laughs> 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 
We are talking mm -hmm. about my background. I come from a theater background. I'm a dancer. 20 years ago, I tried to bring the contemporary dance to China, developing the modern dance scene in China with a private company with my still dancing with next this weekend. It was very difficult. I was so naive. I thought art always can touch audience, but it's not the case anymore. In China, I think at the end of 70s, beginning of 80s, that time the TV business not that relevant, and people going to the theater to see dancing theater concert is a normal you know, action. But now this is everybody stay home. They don't go to theater anymore. I was longing for the people come to theater to see me dancing, which was doesn't work, yeah. trying so hard. Until 2011, I said, OK, I need to strat change my strategy. Then I started getting into the TV. I started to become the judge. You know, we, we import a lot of TV shows, so you think you can dance, Chinese Gala Talent. Mm -hmm. I was get on the panel. I was straightforward. I had a name called the Chinese Sam Cowell. Simon. Yes. Simon. <laughs> Simon Cowell. Simon Cowell. Yeah, people <laughs> love me, and people hate me. Some people she said, she's wonderful, and some people she's a bitch, whatever. <laughs> Same time, I got the attention then. Three years ago, I started the first talk show in China. Now, become every Wednesday night, I have 100 viewers watching my talk show. And people look at me and say, where she come from? And everybody say, she's a dancer. What kind of dance she's doing? She's a contemporary, modern dancer. <laughs> what is modern dance? And now, since two years ago, every year, I have a seven months touring with my company, nationwide, oh, yes. international. And people just rush into the theater because it, I always announced that. I said, listen, audience, dancer is my profession. TV host is my set job, my part job. I can quit any minutes, but I always on stage. That's why I bring a lot of people through the entertainment, but the TV business, bring the audience, come to the theater. That's my way to you know, getting the people come to the theater. I mean, the TV business is 100 million viewers. Let's make it very clear, which is huge. That's Chinese big countries, you know. <laughs> Compared to 100 million is nothing. <laughs> but you know, I, we don't have Twitters. I have a micro, the, how do you say, blog. Every day, even I'm, that was, I'm sending it, I have a, what, 11 million followers every day. Wow. From China, all over China. Over China. Yes, one. <laughs> then I just think what I'm doing here. Then, of course, the talk show is speaking out a lot. But I think that from talk show, I bring the people into the theater. What I'm doing, I'm also acting, also I'm singing, also dancing. That's the art form. That's why I give people so, okay, art. I think always guide and give people hope. But from entertainment, I bring the attract attention to the theater. That's my way to dealing with my people. Yeah. But are you the same person when when you're no, when you're different. on TV? So what's more educational? OK, because on TV business is very tough. You are, when I'm dancing, I'm more myself. But on TV, on a talk show in China, opening a talk show, two weeks ago, I started writing my 100 episodes. was like, wow. Nobody can believe it. And I can just share the story. 10 years ago, I moved to, from Beijing to Shanghai. I sit in there drinking coffee with my girlfriend. I said, look, one day I'll be the top talk show host in China. And my girlfriend said, Drop it, impossible. In China, where we never have a talk show. Then I said, OK. And three years ago, I launched the talk show. Of course, the topic is very sensitive. Certain things I cannot criticize. Uh, many, many things I cannot touch. For example, in America, if a talk show, you're teasing about the president, you know, joking about the stars, everything. But in China, everything is sensible. You cannot touch. How we can survive? OK. <laughs> Let's. Last time I'm talking about the family, talking about the marriage, talking about the relationship, education, and through the all things, then I try to start sending the message, what's the social value of today? That's why also I'm an actress. Certain words, I cannot straightforward, I use my acting skill. I give my eye look to the audience, get it? And people say, get it. So a lot of the things, that's why technique of Chinese words and vocabulary, a lot of the things are under the table, but people sense that. That's the way I'm dealing with this in talk show. That's why I was uh, with my teams. I think a wonderful job. But also, just like before I went in the room, I talked. Two weeks ago, I launched a new show, Chinese Dating. The family parents bring the Chinese matchmaking. You know, father and parents bring the boy looking for the future daughter-in-law, and the mother bring the daughter looking for the, you know, whatever. That's what we start in India. Yeah, exactly. And this show, on the surface, on the surface, people think it's just a dating show. But no, I through the dating show, I was sending them my message as a, what's the Chinese family value according to the marriage, and how they're raising their kids with one child policy. And this year's so whole, when they become young people, two families getting married, engaged together, that's a tremendous 
this issue to discuss about it. And that's why now these days, every Saturday night, 8.30 prime time on China, people debate about this. That's I think I should use metaphor or the entertaining to sending the message I really want to say it. And Forrest, are there any taboos in Hollywood? Taboos? Taboos. We talk about taboos. We talk about you know, entertainment versus yeah. educational. How can you educate? Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, certainly there are taboos in the system. I mean, there are certain subjects that aren't touched as strongly as others. They're trying to do better. You were talking about homosexuality. I think it's, there's, there's, there's films that are coming out more strongly. There's, there's uh, films that deal with gender issues and things of that nature that haven't been there before. But I, I, think, that, I think that people are trying to explore all these areas. They're recognizing that in these areas, there's a, there is an audience of people who want to explore that and understand that. And that audience can be opened up to those others who are interested and curious. And it's happening a lot in, in, our, in our cinema. I think we'll see it a lot. I've, I've had the experience to, um, working on films that people would think, uh, you know, why are we doing this? Like, take, for instance, just culturally, there are not that many Native American films or Native films. You know, uh, we produced a film recently about that. You know, Sauce My Brother taught me. And it was, it was, there, was, there was different difficulties as far as distribution and different things like that. But the film was made, you know? And I think that there are opportunities now to try to reach in and, and tell stories that we never have told before in ways that we've never told them before. It's like a, um, this is a film, I just, I just saw a film, uh, Moonlight, which was quite, quite an interesting film, beautiful film. And I think that it explored a lot of different things. And, you know, in regards to people, people dealing with um, bullying and abuse, in, in, in regards to how society shapes you and how people look at you, shapes you. And then the issue of like uh, 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 sexuality and what the choices are with that. And those things are all, all happening you know, inside of this one piece. And I think it's been embraced. And I think that's a, that's a great thing. Certainly, certainly you're always going to find subject matter that people are not going to want to deal with. But there are those individuals who are now like pushing them to the fore. And I think it's, it's an interesting time in that way. And for, has that changed in the last five years, in the last 10 years? You've been in Hollywood for, for a bit of time. It, has there been a shift, and when? Um, certainly, uh, I think there have always been you know, different, different types of films being made. I think uh, how they were marketed, whether the studio was behind them, whether they were put out in front of an audience, was a question. Mm -hmm. And that's changed. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I could. Still actively changing, you know, but uh, I would say certainly, certainly, with, with if I were looking at like black cinema and the changes that went along throughout throughout that period, there are periods where it was it was quiet. There was only one or so actors who were working in the medium at all during Sidney Poitier's time, and then now that, that changed, and people uh, started to see in the '70s a resurgence that was allowing uh, it to even actually those films those. Ex Exploitation films, as they call them, were sort of saving the industry during that time. And it kind of quieted down. And then we had a new grouping of people where it started to be an urbanization of films where different people from different cultures were all coming together. Now, that, that was a new time, you know? And uh, now we're, we're engaging in a time where people are saying, we see the financial viability of these films and of this audience, Latin, black, Asian, however. We see the equation that allows us to want to make these films those financiers more and more right now, because they can look at the data and see that these films are being embraced by large audiences or different types of audiences. And so that's making a big change uh, over the last you know, five years or so. And Haifa, you're a, so a woman filmmaker in Saudi Arabia. When did you realize that you could really make a difference in, in also the types of films that you were making? Well, just to, to, to top what um, uh, Forrest was saying, just this weekend we have three big film movies in Hollywood that is like um, led by night by uh, big, like big, three big blockbusters. And we have a small film called Hidden Figures, like came and just dominated the weekend. And it is amazing. It's about women going into science and they are women of color and people for sure. Always like when you go to the Hollywood Reporter, they're saying the film is overperforming. <laughs> and it is amazing that <laughs> the film, those kind of films are moving forward. And people never under, mm, saw the potential of those films because, and now they are, the, as, as first was saying, they are, people are seeing the data and seeing new audience. And what people want is not very much like what the studios are. But wanting. why? 
Ava, is, is there um, a change in our consciousness? There is a, for sure, there is a push for diversity in Hollywood. And I think people want to see different stories. They don't want to see the same kind of like gangster movies or whatever. They want to see something real and they want to push forward to the dialogue. I feel like, and there is lots of um, change. And where I come from in Saudi Arabia, I feel like a lot of the films coming from Saudi Arabia about women, even when you're talking about men filmmakers, they go and <laughs> talk about women's issues because it is such, a, such an amazing place to push the society forward in a safe way. It's not like talking about politics, which is like Saudi Arabia is not even like China, right? It's very conservative when it comes mm. to religion and politics and all that. And there is a really small space for artists to maneuver. So it is like um, talking about issues that like family values and bringing uh, empowerment to women and trying to make ease the way to more diversity within the society has been really effective in making people reflect on their own values and maybe changing the bigger picture. So yeah, and does I, that answer your question? Yes, it does. And actually, <laughs> this is something that we were also exploring right before coming on stage is that right. the relationship between <clears throat> filmmakers and artists or, or uh, talk show hosts and politics is actually one that's more important than ever. Because right. you can, um, by drawing a fine line and by being careful, really push the agenda. Well, that's what I've noticed in India as well. Um, I think that mo many filmmakers um, are doing that, just that. You know, they're understating uh, the tonality, the syntax of the film or the TV show, whatever it is. When it's understated and not over-expressing itself and yet making a point, it's working tremendously in India. And I see like exactly... Uh, like you were saying, there's a paradigm shift in Indian cinema where the content has completely become more socially relevant and accountable. And it's done in an entertaining way. And yes. those films have actually worked wonders. This yeah. last two years have seen like an increase in the kind of content about whether it's, as I said, on, you know, on diversity in terms of sexuality, uh, women empowerment. And those have been the biggest blockbusters of the year. And everything that has been frivolous entertainment or just mindless entertainment, which is also something we've thrived on, um, has actually been completely annulled. And so when I, when I hear her, I feel like she's my Chinese soulmate because, uh, <laughs> uh, because I feel like I, I do exactly what Simon Cowell does in India. I judge reality shows. I host a talk show. I come from a film background. And I'm like, I can't believe there's one of me in the world uh, somewhere else. And I feel so empowered to know that, that you know, we're in countries where actually things can be so difficult. Expressing our opinion are sometimes we are very gov governed very strongly by strong political forces. Sometimes you know the politics in our country are so divisive. Uh, that they don't allow art to flourish in, in all its glory. But that's definitely changing because many people are combating it now. But how do you, you, you tread? It's a very fine line, yes. right? So making sure that your point is understood without offending anyone. Fortunately, nuance doesn't get noticed by everyone. Uh, uh, <laughs> I agree. And, and I think uh, the great thing about subtlety is that it's, a, it, it's, like, it's, like, it's like fine wine. Not everyone knows the difference. Uh, so I think when you get really subtle and yet you know you're targeting the audience that's understanding what you're saying, subtlety and nuance are great friends to have in the world of creativity. Do you remember a specific lead character well, that you was, thought, this is a great achievement for, for me and my country? There was, for like a film that, uh, that we produced called Kapoor and Sons, which was a film about a dysfunctional family and secrets that families have that are brushed under the carpet. And the lead protagonist was actually essayed by a Pakistani actor called Fawad Khan. Mm -hmm. um, and you find out right at the fag end of the film, at the end of the film, um, that he is actually a homosexual and he hasn't come out to his family. Now, in Indian mainstream cinema, anyone will tell you that was probably one of the most progressive moments that Indian cinema had ever witnessed. And that film was not only a commercially successful film, but there was nobody who stoned my office. And I was really happy that I, there, was not, there was no kind of a crowd, a procession. No one stoned me. No one tried to kill me. Uh, no one tried to stop the release of the film. And I felt like that was a giant leap forward. When that character was accepted, that movie did well, it was like it gives you power. It empowers you as a filmmaking production house, as a, the director of the film, the writer of the film, to create more characters. To create a homosexual character in India, in mainstream Indian cinema, 
is not the norm. It's normally, it's very parallel, it's alternate, films that are what we call festival-friendly films, but never in the mainstream. Yeah. But, but this is actually a very serious point. This, is, this could be perilous, right, yes. if taken the wrong way. And this is probably the biggest difference between Hollywood or the United States, right. is that do you feel like you're at sometimes endangering yourself if you go too far? You always are. You always are. When you make a strong statement, uh, you're always worried. Uh, you have to kind of, there's a fine line. Whether it comes to religion, it comes to politics, it comes to sexuality, morality. I mean, we all have opinions. We're all, like, I'm, I'm left-wing in my approach. I'm liberal in my approach as a filmmaker and as an individual on a humanitarian basis. But not everything I believe and feel is something I can put out there in a, in a forceful manner because there's also a ramification that awaits me. It could be legal. It could be political or it could be violent at times, you know, and sometimes you just always feel restricted. Uh, but yet, I think what is happening recently is a form of a revolution. And I think taking a leaf out of the wonderful work that Hollywood does in terms of like this year I saw, like, we, uh, like Forrest spoke about Moonlight, exceptional piece of work where it comes to talking about the male testosterone versus sexuality. And I just think it was a great, uh, all, any of the films like Hidden Figures that you mentioned, again, such an empowering story, you know, and so forceful. We're tending to tilt towards those true stories ourselves. Like just, just three weeks ago, we had a film release which is considered the biggest blockbuster of Indian cinema. It's a film about two girls uh, who are actually uh, are in the sports zone. They're they are women wrestler stories, how the father. In India, it's a very big deal that you only push your son in the zone of sport. And here it's about a father who he pushes his two daughters and they emerge victorious. That film has gone on to do the biggest business ever. Just goes to show that it's the newness, it's the, it's the way forward and the progression that is working much more than just the pure entertainment of it. And Junshin, I'm sure there are films like this in China as well. What does it actually do to society to see these strong lead characters? Does it change? Does it give people hope? Does it, do you actually see benefits? Yes, yes I'm big of movie lovers, I love films, I think a movie, whatever, in China, whatever in the country, is a window. People through this window to discover the world, also people from the window looking at what's happening in the country. But the reason really I dare to see that, I think the Chinese movie is quite messy now. Because so much money involved. Our movie industry is booming incredibly. All the Hollywood come to China, make a big movie. But the quality of the film doesn't give so much substance for the young people. Mm. Only the big market, all the Chinese entrepreneurs, when they make big money, what's money for? Let's invest in movies. They don't care, that's a big cast, lots of money after big, and box office. After box office, they put on the stock market, looks good. But with a lot of underneath going on. That's why this thing, big taboo, big issues in China talking about today, about the film industry. That's why I say one way is booming, and one way is very dangerous. How much this movie influenced young people today, look at the film. We have a beautiful art film, the director did a beautiful story of film, but have no box office. And all the money is go for the big giant investment, joint venture productions, the Hollywood influence, everything. That's gives you know completely different idea about the movie. What's the movie about? I'm happy I'm have a small talk show, but I I quite happy this, doing this two years with my talk show launching on the air, I put the three generations of Chinese, usually these days Chinese young kids play the game. You know, young people office going to the internet and senior people sitting at home watching TV. Family, three generation doing their own things. But since the talk show, when I'm launching the talk show, the way I'm talking with people and put the three generation together watching every Wednesday night, say what I'm saying, share the opinions. I can share one story. This is very Chinese dress I wear. In my talk show, I always dress like this. It's a, don't, you don't see this, this Chinese woman dress like this anymore. One day, I was acting in the theater. 100 years old Shanghai lady come to my theater. I said, why you come to see the show? They said, I want to see you in life. Then I asked her, I said, do you understand every Wednesday night what I'm talking about doing my talk show? She said, I don't care. I'm too old for that. But I just want to see you dressing, beautiful dress, floating around in front of the TV, make me feel good. The life is beautiful. That is sweet. Then I know I have to keep this dress for my talk show. If, if, <laughs> even for the, the, the ladies, they just look at you every Wednesday night, and my show's lunching. 
after 10 o'clock. Actually, for a lot of senior people, quite late. And a lot of the senior people over 70 years old, they eat dinner at 6.30, and they go to sleep right away. At 9.30, they wake up watching the talk show <laughs> and see me dressed in Chinese dress, standing there, talk with people, and they give them hope. They said, life's still beautiful. So that's the message I'm sending. Even the, some topic are very sensitive, I cannot touch it. But I know I'm communicating with people and slowly guiding people, you know, balancing what's we're not satisfied with what's happening today in our life. And for, for film, I'm not too much knowledge about it, but as a film lover, audience, Chinese films, big market, but a little messy. I'm sure some Chinese film filmmakers don't like I make comments. <laughs> but also, when I talk show, a lot of young people Q&A every week ask me, Madam Jin, did you see this film? How, what's your comment? My words are very important. If I say this, woman is, this, this film is rubbish, the box office is going down. Yes. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> then I, then I, was, I was really careful with my words. So each film, even sometimes in rubbish film, I said I have to look first. Even I look just for five minutes, I cannot stand it. Then I say, even I see. Then I know I have the power to talk. What is the film about the rubbish about? If some film is really good, then I have to look. Some people say, oh, just give a comment. I say, no, this, this word, this mouth, have a certain responsibility. You cannot just sing it. And that's why I give a slow, small guidance for the people. What kind of right film, what kind of art can pulling people from the judgment? Yeah. And, and for us, what kind of films do you think people want to see today? Is it, it, is, is it films of hope, uh, away from the blockbusters, or is it actually difficult films that help us see the world a little bit differently? I, mean, I think it's, it's some of every, it's, I mean, look, c cinema is just like a giant metaphor of like sitting around a fire, you know? People connecting and following the same story. People wanting to hear different things, different myths that like exemplify what they think life is about. I think right now we have a lot of socially conscious films that are coming forward, you know. Um, but at the same time, we also have extremely large, as you say, you know, superhero yeah. films. You know what I mean? That maybe appeal to the sort of archangels or angels of our of our minds. You know, that this, where we do superhuman things. You know, and so those those, those both of those things are. Are, are working together in, in some kind of weird way. I think a lot of people would say they're more frustrated that they can't make the smaller films or the yeah. films with deeper substance. But I, you know, I have to say, because I, I, I do, I, I get the opportunity to produce films. You know, uh, my partner, Nina Yang, uh, has produced the last four films for us, and every time they've, they've had, they're, they're, they're socially conscious films. You know, uh, with Oscar Grant, we did, we did, a, we did Fruitvale Station, we did, we did Dope, you know, we did uh, this, the film I was telling you, as my brother taught me, and all these films they found their way. They found their audience, a real audience, a strong audience. So it's, it, it, there is room for, for, for that. You know what I mean? There is a, a, a lot of room happening. I mean, right now, when I leave from it, I go look at Roxanne, Roxanne, which we just did, which is, uh, you know, takes place, it's a female rapper, and, and in, in itself, it's also, it's entertaining. But it uh, has some very social messages in regards to her life and stuff. So those things are all kind of percolating. There's still people that are going to be really frustrated. There are going to be people culturally will say, you know, well, we can make a film up to this range of a budget. Uh, let's say we can make a film up to eight million, and they'll let me do it. If it's up in the 15 area, and I go up to 15, then all of a sudden people start to start to question whether or not it's viable enough. From that, they have to jump to these super superhuman films, you know. Or, you know, I mean, mystical, mythical films. You know. but, so for example, Fruitvale, which you mentioned, you were a producer on this film, mm -hmm. and it was a film about the BART transit police shooting of Oscar Grant. Why do you think it's important to do films like this? It seems that in many cases, film is much more powerful than the media. Oh, I, OK. I, I, this, this film is you know, it's a true story about Oscar Grant, and, and I think where the country itself was dealing with issues of profiling and um, abuse by the police into the community and stuff. And, and Ryan Coogler, who's the director, who's a really talented filmmaker, that was his first film. And he was able to, to bring that story out and you know, humanize a character without, without trying to make him pure or perfect. Mm -hmm. For us to watch that story and understand the struggles in it. Um, and I've, I've had like company for quite a long time. so. I think in the beginning we, we did films, they were still socially relevant films, and they all like rode along. You know, we did uh, 
The Green Dragon, which was a film about Vietnamese refugees, which was called American Gun, it was about guns and, and abuse and stuff in the country. And, and all those films have found their way as, as well as dope. But I think Ryan's movie, um, you know, Fruitvale, came about also at a time where the trials were coming forward. And so it, it garnered even more attention. And I think, in deep credit to him, he's an extraordinary filmmaker, extraordinary writer. And I was happy that he walked to my office when he was in school. So. Haifa, do you remember a lead character that you put on screen which changed your life and, and maybe Saudi women's lives a little bit? I don't know about Saudi women's lives at all, <laughs> but certainly my first film, Wajda, like, um, and we're, you were talking about censorship and writing with censorship. I feel it's very empowering to write with censorship because every time you want to say something and you can't say it and you say it in a different way, it's kind of victory. And it is really frustrating. It's frustrating and hard, but it is kind of like, it is, it is a way to move forward. It is not easy, but it is sweating your way up <laughs> to write a script, which is really, I feel it sometimes, it's rewarding because you could deconstruct something that is, wasn't able, so, so rooted and so deep. And you brought, and you, as an artist, that is what you strive for. It's to bring that kind of like, uh, you know, like right. to, to go to the deep of the matter and people entertain and people are happy and they embrace you. And that is what you, as an artist, that is what you want, to feel like to write a joke and see people laugh at the joke or just, and even if it is like, it means that they have to go home and re-question some of their values. And, um, and I just recently finished um, um, an English film like uh, about Mary Shelley. And I was, um, that woman is crazy. Like she dominated science fiction when she is like a teenager. She is only 17. And I found a lot of like, commonality with that woman who was like, who grew up like in England and I was like, I'm Saudi, what happened? Why they sent me that script? But she grew up, grew up in that conservative society. Like it is very, women are supposed to dress in a certain way, to act in a certain way. She, she, Jane Austen was the biggest writer ever and she was writing social drama and everybody wanted her to write something similar like social criticism about marriage and jealousy. And, but she totally abandoned that. And she wrote something very masculine, questioning God and having like all that kind of philosophy. And for me, like just being part of that character is coming to life. It was amazing. And we had El Fanning to star, which is a young actress, and she had all this young energy to bring into the character. It was really cool. And it, it is, I felt like I'm, I was touched by that character as well. And it is in a different way. Because what there was my creation is like from my hometown, where she comes from, and something, something that I know really totally, and I just brought into life. But that person, I went to her life, and I felt, how can we all similar, and how can, like especially women, and what issues we deal with on on a to totally different levels. Like, Haifa, why are there not more women filmmakers across the world? It's amazing to see such a successful filmmaker from Saudi Arabia, and yet you go to Hollywood, and there and there are fewer of them, or not that many more. Yeah, no, I think the statistics I read, like that they're less than, now than 1998, but I think there is a push for women filmmakers and for women's writers. And there is room now with a lot of films making well by women and about women, like even Star Wars had like yeah. Felicity Jones as a lead, which she was amazing. It was really empowering to see, oh, it is not only like, it's a very male kind of film, right? It is like, but it is, we have female leads now that are even um, uh, coming into the superhero and the mainstream. So I think it is very promising, but it's also up to women to break into it because people like, they're unconscious about the, the, the gender. Like there is always like, discrimination and people are sexist, even if they don't know it. And it is in the subconscious like kind of level. And dealing with that and trying to break it, and, but you should not forget it as a woman. You know that you have to deal with that and you have to move forward. And it is not the way, you, should, you shouldn't see it as something that is, um, you should see it as a fact that you need to move over and push it out of your way. It is not something that you have to deal with every day. It is something you need to push to the side so that you're clear, you have a clear path. Does it make you braver? Ah, it makes me a little bit nastier. <laughs> no, but it is. Uh, certainly, it's brave when you go to a set and all are men and like they always like question and they have like they are together like and you are like the question your your question especially in Saudi, like someone was like a woman like uh, like I'm the boss and tell them something and it's just like ah 
I was like, don't question, just do. <laughs> so it's hard sometimes, but it is, um, I think it, you need to trust people also, and people need to see that you are not feeling you are, you want to go against them. You want them to see you as I am invested in your, like if you are a cinematographer, DP, or an art designer, whatever person, I rely on your success as much as you rely on my success. And that is very important to understand that trust, that I, I am empowering you. I'm not trying to dominate you because I am a woman, and maybe you think I'm weak. I need to come on top of you until you exactly respect me. I need to give you the space to create, and the same way you need to give me that space. And I feel that kind of like, um, it helped me. It helped me like, um, make friendship and have like, <laughs> how to deal with men, I guess, be friends. <laughs> Let's have coffee together. <laughs> and Karan, you st we started the conversation with you talking about accountability. Where does that accountability come from? Is it social media and, and platforms? I don't know whether it's distribution or aerials, aerial TV, or is it actually millennials? Is there a generational gap? Well, definitely, I think the millennials are far more progressive in their approach. Uh, they're more exposed to, I think, an, a new age and a new form of expression. Uh, but also, I think social media and media in general has made even like the filmmakers more accountable because the, the media has definitely trained the thought process, at least a large section of the media, of how a viewer sees a film now in terms of like, you know, you feel like you're just not out there making whatever you like because you know that there's an entire policing. For heaven's sake, social media is like the most, is, is, is like a, the most ad hoc policing that exists. I mean, you know, especially back home in India, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, like everyone has an opinion. It's so daunting everyone. for a filmmaker. <laughs> like in no other industry in the world is their product judged on that release Friday the way we are. It's like family. I mean, you know, it's like, it's crazy. You wake up and I go through bouts of nausea on that Friday morning because you feel like you're on the verge of just going to collapse because everyone's either abusing you, praising you, being like excessively opinionated about what you made. Well, and, do you check blogs? I check everything. Media? I'm a complete sucker. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, like I, I check everything. I read blogs, I read reviews, I read opinions. I'm crazy like that. I, it's like I almost want that kind of criticism <laughs> to kind of nurture me further. I read everything and I want to tell you, like if you are anywhere close to being a cardiac patient or you're, or you're on the verge of in any case going through anxiety, issues which I do from time to time, you can have a complete meltdown on that morning because you feel that everyone has such strong opinions on your work. So you can't just think that entertainment is just going to be entertaining and just going to put out something that is just going to be frivolous and fun because there is a tremendous policing. And some of us can diss social media. We can say it's a millennial fancy. We can say it's frivolous. We can say it's random. It's full of unhappy, isolated uh, people that are so sad that they put their thoughts out, you know. Uh, but they exist. There is but, so much unhappiness in the world, and they have opinions. But, 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 by, but by listening to those opinions, do you not fear that you're stifling your creativity? Oh, well, how can you not listen to those opinions? Because those opinions put bums on seats. So eventually, those opinions are have going to matter. And there are those people who have opinions and are not arriving to the cinema hall or watching your TV in any case. But you have no siphoning process. I have no way of kind of segregating one from the other. All I can do is be a victim of that opinion. And you know, and I, and I can react. And, and let me tell you, when the praise comes, you feel like it's, and sometimes you're a victim of yourself. Sometimes you've created an image for yourself in the world of entertainment. No matter what you do, you will not be liked for what you've done. You will not get your due. Or sometimes you could be a cerebral filmmaker and have a reputation because you carry that demeanor and you'll be loved even if you make a piece of crap. You know, you'll be like, it's, it's also a point of perception. But other than that, there is governance. There is accountability, and a large part of that is the, is the force of the media. And you know, we as filmmakers can go horse trying to say, like, critics don't matter, opinions don't matter, but we're living in la-la land. They all matter. They make a big difference. They make a big difference when people go out there and write strong things online, on the internet, and they have opinions, blogs. People write so much. I sometimes wonder where they have the time. <laughs> and, and like, I really feel like I've read people like analyze my work, and I haven't bothered to analyze my own work to that extent. And I don't think it's worthy of that analysis. And so many of them will write reels and reels and pages uh, online about like a film I've made, or an article I've written, or a show I've hosted. And I'm like, 
they really have so much to say. <laughs> like, I would be exhausted of my own opinions after a point, you know? <laughs> because, you know, you can't be on an opinion treadmill all your life. Sometimes you just have to kind of just let go. But no one knows how to do that anymore, I think. It's <laughs> <laughs> great insight. Jinxin, you were, you were nodding through a lot of that. Do you look at reviews? Yes, but no, no, I, I'm the person, you know, in China. But she's apparently the review. <laughs> I was so, I, I'm petrified. She's, she's the I, Oprah I, I wish I had that power as a talk show host to say, I hate that film and it just flops. No, <laughs> actually, make sure she likes your film. No, in my Chinese Twitter, Chinese we have micro blog. I have 11 million followers. I'm the one. Usually, people think the big star, big TV host. You must be my Twitter or my managing my, my office, my assistant. No, since 2011, I'm launching my tweet. You know, from 1,000 viewer until 11 million now. Everything I respond by myself to my finger. Then, wow. yeah, really, I'm, every day I'm responding. Really, I've, I swear to God. And even some people read, really, you know, the truth, gossip on you, you know, blame on you, everything. I fight back. I have no hesitating. <laughs> some people say, oh, you are blah, 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 blah. Then I really fight back. Then people are shocked. They say, oh, she's really fighting back. <laughs> it's, not a fake, it's not her yeah, assistant. Everybody, I, I gave the word. Then suddenly the world getting small. The people will be netting touch you, but the truth is modern media, they can target you. In the moment, then just, of course, in my audience, 90% audience, they, they give some certain correct opinions. But a lot of people really target things. I don't know how many audience sit tonight, today sitting here know my background. They have nothing to target my dancing, nothing to target my talk show, and they target my personal life. Because I was the first transgender, you know, from best male dance to female dance. Then they, they suddenly target your personal life. Exactly. Then. Then they target your children because I adopted three children. Then they target your children. Everything. It's very nasty people. They're behind the, the screen like this. Then I was talking talk show. I said, I will, if some people can front me, I will give you applause and fight with me, not just behind like this. This is the modern media created a lot of nonsense things. But how we briefly dealing with it, this is another attitude. That's why I, through my talk show, through my soft media, I really straightforward. That's why more and more Chinese young people appreciate it. I really no hesitations. I'm a TV host, but also I'm a regular human being. I have the right, if you choose a bad word to me, I have to protect my kids. Yeah. It's not just like, okay, no, 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 no. I'm straight right back. That's why this is the character also getting a lot of compliment from young people. Now, we, that's why modern media, is, we, can, we can challenge it with a double sword. One way to open the world, discover the new world, one way also to, to value morality system is very, you know, change a lot in China. You, you are really the champion of, of the lead character, right? That, that has also changed the perception in China. Did you always feel that way? No, that's not my intention. That's not my intention. Everything, people thinking, you are the, some Chinese young people said, oh, she's the liberty study of China. I do so many things in my life, always challenging the boundary of society. But nothing for the, I didn't want to put myself in that position. I just want to be myself. Then I said, all the personal choices, what I've achieved in the dance, modern dance world, TV shows, everything, I come in with my passion to do it. And people have all kinds of opinion I accepted, but not my intent. I want to become public figures to influence other people. I'm not belong to any groups. I just independent, a dancer, actress, and TV host. That's it, purely clear as that. Yeah. One last question for us, and then I'm gonna take questions from the floor, so yeah. prepare yourself and you can uh, just put your hand up and tell us who you are. Um, Forrest, do you, because Hollywood is so prominent worldwide, do you feel that gives you an extra, I don't know if it's bonus or onus, to actually you know, do something life-changing. So ad advance educationally or, or push the barriers. I think that that's a responsibility that everyone has to be able to step forward and try to, to um, allow our planet to be a better space to live in, you know? I don't, uh, I don't uh, I, 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 maybe I have a larger platform that could do that. But uh, I think that every individual has in some ways that responsibility um, to do it. I, I just have to. Com I just have to comment because I'm like totally blown away by like the, the way you, you you deal with your art and stuff too. You know, which um, like for me, I didn't. I don't really read reviews. Um, I mean, I read them sometimes. You know, I, I'm scared of looking at bad ones. I'm very, you know, it hurt me. You know what I mean? Um, I just do my work and try to like find the truth and and live in that truth and and, and give it out. I'm not saying that there aren't films that I've done that are questionable, you know what I mean? Um, certainly there are, but on the whole, I just try, you know, to connect in some way to a, a sort of 
for me, the divine type truth in some ways, you know, and, and hope that the people will receive it. It's like giving a gift. You give a gift, you, you don't, you, know, you can't expect somebody to give you one back necessarily, mm. or you wouldn't really give it, you know. So you give it, and then you, you, you hope that it's received, kind of. This isn't to negate what you said, because yeah. I'm amazed by you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. great. No, but, but I, I just, I'm just talking from my No, but my that would experience. be such a wonderful place to reach, actually. Uh, sometimes, you know, opinions and that, that sense of um, validation that sometimes filmmakers like me, at least I look, seek for it all the time, it can be exhausting. And I think what you're saying is so beautiful because if you really just found that beauty in your art and that truth in your art and believed in it so strongly in yourself, um, it would be so much more easy for, for a creative force. But for me, I think that that validation matters so much more than it should, and it's a weakness. I don't think it's a strength. I'm not saying I'm secure yeah. as a person, as an artist. I'm, I, I try my best, yeah. you know, but I can't say that, that that's what I'm, I'm reaching towards trying to do something. It's more than myself. Right. And when I reach that out and I, I try to give that out, then uh, I'm hopeful that when the box is open that there's going to be some sort of ether that comes out that gives somebody a breath of something that they wanted to see or some right. experience. You know, and that's all. You know, yeah. it's, it's very appreciated. Great, questions from the floor. So if you have, please put your hand up. Great, the gentleman on the third row there, who's the first one to put his hand up. And if you could say uh, who you are and who the question is to, please. Anand Singh, um, to Forrest first, um, you're being far too modest. If you look at his body of work, that he's made choices and as a filmmaker, both as a producer and an actor, it's an exceptional body of work. And when you think of the challenges that these, some of these films had to get made, like uh, The Butler, which uh, nobody wanted to finance, and everybody took uh, very little money, and ultimately audiences did go to see it, and I think it, it grossed over $200 million um, at the box office. But uh, my question, Karen, is to you. Um, it's great to see audiences today in India embracing social issues in cinema. Uh, do you think the time is going to come soon where Indian stories like Slumdog Millionaire or Lion are actually made by Indian filmmakers, that they would actually take on the, uh, the storytelling that lived in India with Satyajit Ray and all of them years back? And now I think you have that group of talent there, and it's just people need to be able to push that uh, out of them. Thanks. Um, well, Slumdog Millionaire and Lion, both films I've seen, are actually contemporary uh, stories uh, told uh, in contemporary times. Um, and actually, it was when I saw Lion just now, I was fascinated about how, uh, how else do I word it, how completely Hindi film the film really was. And the fact that it wasn't nurtured by someone back home in India was actually very saddening. Was had I been given this narrative, I would have been so proud to direct a film with this kind of story. And it's one, it's it's sad on one level that you know it took Hollywood to make a film that could have been that was half in Hindi actually. The whole film was like the ethos, the syntax, everything was so traditional. So Slumdog Millionaire, of course, is a complete like I would say Western take on an Indian story. So I'm not talking about Slumdog because everyone who says Slumdog is a Bollywood film, they don't know anything about Bollywood films. <laughs> Uh, Slumdog is not a Bollywood film. It is completely structured, conceptualized for a Western audience. But Lion was not like that. Lion was like a full-out cathartic cry. Like I found myself weeping sitting in that cinema hall, just like I would when I watch an Indian language film. And I felt like Lion should be a story that should have been told. It's what we call the quintessential lost and found formula film that used to exist in Hindi cinema in the 70s. And it was exactly that. And uh, performed fantastically by the lead artists and very moving narrative. But uh, I don't think Slumdog, I would equate Monsoon Wedding, Slumdog, these are not Bollywood films. They've been made with a totally different audience. But yes, when, to answer your question about Lion and the storytelling and new filmmakers doing different things, well, I hope they're empowered because the audience definitely is. I always feel like in back home in India, the audience, uh, the filmmakers are 10 steps behind the audience, which is really sad. And I can take accountability for that. I don't think I'm as progressive as my audience is, and I attain to get there. Fred, we have another question. So the lady on the second row and then the gentleman on the first row. Thank you very much. My name is Lorna Irungu. I'm from Kenya in East Africa and have been on stage, acted, and actually invested in a production company. My question is to all of you. One, the growth of 
television on demand. So Netflix, Hulu, Amazon provides people an opportunity to watch movies that would not make it to the theaters in lots of places, whether it's documentary features or very powerful pieces of work. What are you as filmmakers doing to leverage on that, to be able to showcase great stories in that? That's part one. Part two, um, on, and he brought it up, on lead or great actors taking up roles in smaller movies so that they're done. So the example of the butler. Do you think we can get more of these stories told if, very mo if more people are willing to you know, kind of take the pay cut because this matters and put it on a platform that's not as expensive? Because I, in East Africa, now have access to films that I would never have seen anywhere else. Mm. But it's because of the demand. Mm. And so whereas social media has been key in how people right. think of movies, how is this new technology going to impact film? And are we going to see declining theaters, but more on the silver screens? Great. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take the question about distribution and how we, we access films? Uh, well, visibly India, I mean, I can speak of Amazon and Netflix and yeah. all that, that is creeping into India right now. Uh, but a digital is like this new big toy that everyone in India thinks that they should play with, but they have no idea about. Uh, you know, it's a growing phenomenon. But I know in, in, in everywhere else, uh, the, their ground realities and digital is, is a very strong medium. So Visavi -vis India is still a growing force. Um, I mean, if you have, there's lots of great content on digital that is actually pathbreaking in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think particularly in the, in the state side, I think it's beginning all over the world. I mean, it's a medium break, meaning that we're, we're starting to look at television, cable networks, all these different things as well is one whole medium where you can move in and out of them and go from one one to the other. And, and as a result, it's, it's giving more opportunities because there's no more platforms that will be able to make the funds that are necessary for artists to be able to, to work. Like I know there's a number of, a lot, a lot of actors or, or artists I know are like really excited about what's going on in the, in the, in the as you say, in the cable world or in, in, in the Netflix world. And, Amazon, uh, uh, Hulu, uh, all these different companies that are now feeding product out, and people are receiving it as if it's some of the best product. It's some of the writing is, is considered some of the strongest writing. Some of the shows are, so you're getting artists doing shows that would never do shows before, under time frames where they don't have to, where maybe before they have to give up two years of their life, three years of their life, whatever. Now they can say, I'm gonna give up four months to do 10 shows of something that will be quality and expert. And then at the same time, I'm going to do this film, and I have an audience already. It's built in on Netflix. It's built in on these different places. They're going to watch it, and I'm going to put it out there, and they're going to come and see it. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's an opening, in a way, at least. It, it's, it, for me, it's like when, when they thought, there was, first there was like TV, and they thought, okay, if you put more channels, that's going to destroy it. You get cable, that's going to destroy it. You just, it they kept getting afraid. It's like a, you, get, you get a cassette, you know, you're not going to have, that'll kill a track. It could, it just, but actually, it continued to grow. So the marketplace became so much, well, now uh, people say that music is free. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, but it's everywhere and accessible. And they're finding ways to, like, you know, monetize it. And film, actually, has been monetizing itself a little bit in an interesting way, you know. Um, you know, I hope that helps somewhat. Um, yeah. Yeah. One thing, I come from Saudi Arabia where cinema theaters are still not permitted. So it is a great way for younger people to see that, like before even that, people um, go online to watch films and piracy is huge. But I would say, like, we want to go to theater. It's an amazing medium. I, I wish, like, it is like it's such a mystical thing to go to a closed room with a group right. of people and watch a film. And I really hope that doesn't disappear. Yeah. It is just like, um, it is just has all its paradiso and all those films. And it's just like, it is the legacy that you want as an artist to preserve. And I know in film, the, the actual film like disappeared and we all filmed like Disney digitally. Movie. Like we were, it's a heartbreaking moment yeah, for was. everybody. And it really was. Yeah. yeah it really was. <laughs> and it's so, so like, yeah. So I hope it doesn't disappear, but I hope in the places like Saudi Arabia or places where people cannot have access to that art, that it will break. And it's like democracy it comes in, it's, it creeps into other places and bring art everywhere. Could I have the question from the gentleman in the front row and then one at the back afterwards? Please. Hi, my name is Alim. I'm a global shaper from the Perth Hub in Australia. Uh, my question is to, uh, to Forrest. Um, in the United States, the African-American uh, ticket or the African-American dollar is the most powerful in terms of box office revenue. 
Um, and it, I think in, despite that, there's still very little representation of people of color uh, in mainstream film. And I think even more than that, the level of recognition in terms of awards uh, is still underwhelming. So what, what will it take for, um, um, I guess, studios to increase their diversity um, and for associations to recognize talent from diverse communities, particularly in the United States where minorities feel at this time uh, less valued and less included? Yeah, I think there's like, I don't know, 13%, you know, of the films have like this minority artists like in those positions. There's like 40% of us in, in the country, you know. You talk about black film, it's, uh, it does have a, does have an audience that goes consistently and a certain break point, you know, financially, that the studios feel they can make certain amounts of money. And another break point, they feel like they don't, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's disappointing, but I think that the opening of what we were just talking about is going to equal is equalizing a lot of that, equalizing some of that in a way um, of the different places and, and opportunities for being able to tell stories and the opportunity to show films on on screen at the same time, maybe simultaneously on the smaller screen or ten weeks before in the little screen and then go to the big screen. And even that is making money. So there's a time now where the numbers, because so part of it was numbers, and part of it was, was a, uh, well, I think some some prejudices behind the people who were making the choices, you know. But uh, there was always this equation. I think that equation is changing. I think people are looking at that data, and it is shifting, not in the, as quickly as we want, not as quickly as you know I would hope it would do so. You know what I mean? And. You know, as far as like um, the wards and things of that nature, it's because it's a subjective thing. It's difficult. I think they're reshaping some of the some of the, the voting. You know, the voters in different different uh, of the groups in the academy groups and different ones and offering people to be able to join. Where it was a large club of, of uh, older filmmakers or artists before. Now, new fil filmmakers or artists are getting to come in. Of, of different social and cultural backgrounds and stuff, and that will hopefully start to change that, so that, that things will open up for that awareness to change. You know. So the hour flew by, so we only have time for one last question at the back there. Hi, I'm Irani Jiri. I'm the Minister of Communications and Culture for the Canadian government, and I would like to ask you questions about um, the public role in uh, promoting international domestic content. Of course, we have, like many countries, public policies to support um, the, the fact of having domestic Canadian content that, is, um, that can be viewed uh, by, by Canadians. And now, what is your, is there, in the context of this great globalization where people have access to global content, is there a role for, for, for governments to support domestic content internationally? I would say, I wasn't able to make Wajda, which is my first film in Saudi Arabia and shot entirely in Saudi Arabia. I wrote it and all cast Saudi. The majority of the money came from Germany. Mm. I went to, and Saudi Arabia is a rich, rich country and TV is huge. I knocked on every door to support the film and there was no answer because cinema is not allowed and it's about a young girl, it's about a woman empowerment. It is a totally different story. And because of public funds in France and in Germany and other places, where producers are making films in different other places. Well, I had to have German crew, like a, a lot of like my crew were Germans. They came to Riyadh and she's a different story. But I wasn't able to make the film without, um, without, without that help. And I think, it, I think public funds are very important in preserving that kind of artistic and scary kind of like risk taking. It gives a platform for, for artists like me if we want to make films. and. And the film is German as well as Saudi, which is really, I'm really <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> well, India's I have never really had a problem raising money for their domestic market uh, because cinema is such a large uh, like part of our, of our existence. Um, in fact, when, when the Hollywood studios came in, uh, some of them had to even adapt to the Indian way uh, because they weren't used to the way we function, which can be ad hoc at times. And um, I don't think we have a sense of uh, like doing things the way probably they were used to. 
So I remember they had to struggle with like, you know, the, the, the film producers in India and had to adapt. So raising that kind of money to make domestic Indian content has never been an issue because it's always been the mainstay entertainment yeah. of our country. And it's always, it's grown from force to force. So yeah, so that hasn't been an issue. But having said that, there are so many subsidies actually uh, that happen between India and Canada, India and, and Great Britain, India and parts of North America, where you get like 30% and 40% subsidies when you shoot and film in those areas, which is more tourism related. Uh, and, and, and God knows that if you give us things that are free, we run there. So it's, it's, it's <laughs> Everywhere. great. For China, in our government, constantly have public funds, always supporting art and education. And this day is talking about the World Economic Forum. China dealing with so many international stage in the economy. But we discovered that after business deal, what's the most influential is the cultural and soft power. That's why our government put a lot of public funds to supporting art and creative. But uh, with the, the commercial money, now in China, the big money involved is the TV business. Quick, fast, and everybody, all the major stars, they want to join to TV, do the reality show, make a time show. And second big money is loading to because Hollywood influence filmmaking. That's a lot of big commercial films. But the art, for the art foundation, supporting government constantly supporting it. Because you need that in China so big, and the government puts this money really exclusively for the art education. We put, I think, maybe 70% on the education, art education, like the really young artists have the opportunity to buy. But that's the, I think, constant, that's our Chinese government doing quite a good job and a lot of money into it. We're running out of time, so I'm going to ask you one question in 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. First, what is your biggest hope for storytelling, so wide, storytelling in 2017? <laughs> that it's inclusive, that it uh, pushes the envelope of our, our understanding of each other, and that it links us uh, more clearly by the themes that it makes. Haifa? I, and so certainly I want to see more female filmmakers, cinematographers, and uh, scriptwriters below the lines. We love female stars, and they are amazing, but we want women behind the camera. Yeah. Khan? I, I, I just hope stories are more personal, because eventually we're all a prototype. There are, always, <laughs> there are a million of us in the world. No, I think according to China, Chinese in society, women now is very highly evaluated. That's also in good way to society changing, but also another way to the very talented woman cannot find a husband. <laughs> because too, they are too overeducated. <laughs> That's another issue. That's why I'm producing my show, Chinese making, Chinese matchmaking show. But I think 2017 for us is the we have the open dialogue. And today, you know, for Chinese people never pay attention to an American election in history. <laughs> but now become a Chinese topic, talk about the American election. That's why I think now the stage is open up to the everybody to talk about it openly and no hesitation and bring the best opinion and the suggestion to the plan, to the world. I think 2017, we have a lot of uncertainty, but I think hope still there. Chinese always think hope still always there. And I do hope, I do hope that minority voices, new voices, are able to come out and speak yeah. and show the full tapestry of, of our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for a great, great panel. Thank you.